And to you, our executive keynote panel members, Brian Connor, Connor, uh, partner at Moss Adams uh, and national practice leader for hospitals. Um, Melissa Stafford-Jones, region, regional director of US, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Region 9. Uh, Gary Tobin, president and CEO of the Los Angeles Area Chamber of Commerce. And Peter Long, uh, the president and CEO of the Blue Shield of California Foundation. Thank you all for being here. Great. Um, so, you know, let me ask just kind of an easy question to start, uh, Peter. What are some of your highlights of the day? You've been in and out and, and around for a lot of today. Uh, away from some of the conversation. Uh, it's a great question. Thanks very much for uh, being here, and thanks all of you for being here. Um, I'd say to me the thing I've been struck by um, in a good way is the tension between building kind of where we've come from and where we want to go and managing that tension of what's the right path um, in terms of incrementally continuing to build on the investments under the Affordable Care Act and the framework and bringing folks into the system in contrast to pool strategies that are straight population health or looking outside of the healthcare system. So I think that's been a healthy dialogue. Um, and the second I think is that people are, what's exciting is people don't seem exhausted after five years of the Affordable Care Act. They actually seem energized and ready for what's next. Um, and so that's very encouraging for me in terms of that people aren't literally falling over and saying, oh, it's taken so much just to get people into health insurance, but they're really asking the questions of, okay, now that we've got the system and now that we've made some progress, what happens next? Yeah. Um, I think we've got great ideas from long-term care ideas to, m to rethinking Medi-Cal in California. I mean, just across the board, whole new sets of ideas for us to kind of work with and, and explore. So yeah. I think that's exciting. Melissa, well, the same question. You've been around for much of the day. What are some of your takeaways? What are the kinds of things you're hearing in the hallway, which is often the best thing that we can't advertise, is a conversation <laughs> in the hallway. Uh, what are you hearing? You caught me in the hallway a number of times <laughs> today, actually. You know, I think that, um, I know that one of your goals when we first had a chance to meet several months ago was to bring together folks from a lot of different sectors to an event like this and create a dialogue that maybe people are having with folks who are in their normal circle but not outside their normal circle. And I, my sense is you accomplished that yeah, today. I mean, you. I've seen um, through a lot of the discussions, the breakouts, the keynotes, that kind of um, cross-organizational discussion on issues that are of common interest that might not happen in, in everybody's uh, sort of everyday uh, work life. And I think in terms of the hallway conversations, um, one of the things that, that I've heard and been engaged in I think is really important is um, how do we uh, do all the things that Peter was talking about that need to happen, think about pathway, but also keeping our eye on that prize of where we're really trying to go is health so mm -hmm. the health care piece matters, the population health piece matters, the mechanisms matter, all of how the, how the pieces of the system work together uh, really matter. Uh, but that focus of where are we really trying to go for individuals, for their families, for communities is that focus on health. Yeah. Brian, uh, Moss Adams has a great conference on health care itself. It happens to be next week at this time. Do um, I owe you anything for that, the, the <laughs> shameless plug, or is that free? So, you know, you've, you, you, you've been in a lot of different kinds of conferences, and I appreciate Moss Adams' uh, event sponsorship of this one. Um, what are some of the, the threads that you, you heard today in conversations that sort of cross these silos? Are there some, um, some high-level kind of takeaways or themes that you are hearing people talking about commonly? Well, yeah, I think... Uh, um, a lot of the themes and the conversations that we've had here today, we, you know, you hear when you have, uh, you get people like this, smart people who are involved in the healthcare industry uh, in a room together to chat about. The one that, the, the thing that's been surprising and I think really intriguing uh, about today's session is the policy discussion. Uh, you know, I think to our conference, I think to a lot of conferences you go to and you're talking operations, mechanics, uh, financing. Uh, those kinds of things that we're involved in and to hear the, you know, the overt kind of policy and political discussions that are so naturally intertwined when you talk about the healthcare industry. I mean, yeah. it's just a big part of uh, the solutions, the challenges, the opportunities in healthcare and to hear people talk about that in these kind of sessions openly uh, and comfortably, I think, is, has really been, uh, you know, a pleasant surprise from yeah. my perspective. Good. So. Uh, 
don't be shy, you all. Uh, so, you know, I can't see uh, terribly well, but if you all want to want to ask a question, don't be shy. We'll, we'll make sure that this is a, a dialogue with, with the audience as well. Gary, uh, as we were discussing, uh, the Chamber has been a good partner in trying to get the word out about, uh, about this event, and I appreciate that. One of the hardest groups to engage in this conversation as we think about each of the different silos that we want to get here is the HR benefit manager, the employer that, that pays the bills, that drives this whole thing, either through uh, premiums or taxation or other vehicles. What are the topics that you're hearing your members discuss related to healthcare, either your healthcare organization members or others that are just paying the bills? Well, business people certainly do have a little different perspective because they're not providers every day, they, but they pay the bills. And so their number one concern is cost. While I think lots of people were involved in the Affordable Care Act to help provide more access, the business community said, if it can help us reduce costs or slow down the escalation of costs, that's what we're interested in. And so you hear very mixed responses from the business community. The ones you don't hear from, it's probably okay. The ones we do hear from uh, are talking about the, cat the tax on the Cadillac benefits. They're talking about having to change policies because the policies that they were providing uh, don't fit. They're, they're talking about the fact that there are continued um, increases in the cost of care. My guess is that a lot of people thought, well, maybe this will eliminate the increases. And of course, that is not, that is not happening. We do not hear a constant chattering about the Affordable Care Act and Obamacare. But most of the people that we do hear from have some concern relative to cost. Mm -hmm. you know, so th this, the theme of this session is looking back on the five years of the ACA and looking ahead to the next five. And I I'm glad you brought the Cadillac tax up, Gary, the 40% the tax on uh, premiums and excise tax that employers will pay on, on premiums or benefits. Uh, starting in 2018 for an individual whose who's, uh, uh, premium is $10,500 or more, or a family that is $27,500 or more, family of four. In 2010, the, it, when the ACA passed, the idea of that Cadillac tax was to force plans and providers to have a conversation that by making a 40% excise tax so great and so painful, it would drive conversations that wouldn't normally happen in the marketplace on their own. And so therefore, it would force pain. Does anyone think today in 2015 that that policy is a good policy? Well, it forced plenty of pain. Yeah. <laughs> should, should the Cadillac tax be repealed? I mean, what do, what do you all think? I, Gary, maybe yes. your answer is probably pretty clear, right? Yes. Does anyone think it should be repealed? I think your answer might be pretty clear. Yeah. I mean, the administration's position on the Cadillac tax is clear. Right. We, we oppose repealing it. It both, that would add to the deficit, but we and uh, the vast majority of economists actually do think that it is an important lever in terms of working on this issue of addressing and controlling health care costs. So uh, we, we do not, we do have concerns about repealing it and do think it needs to stay in place. I'm not sure there is a single presidential candidate, I'm not sure what Martin O'Malley's position on this is, but I don't believe there's a single presidential candidate that supports keeping the Cadillac tax. Brian, should we keep it? Or, or can the health system figure out how to have this conversation on its own? Well, I think there, you know, as, as you alluded to, I mean, there's a lot of momentum to get rid of the Cadillac tax. It really serves two purposes, as Melissa referred to. Uh, you know, one, it's a, a designed lever to help control costs, a punitive lever. How effective that will be or is, I think, is up for debate. The other thing that is, it's a funding mechanism. It's a funding mechanism to fund all the access and to balance all the access that we've granted. 
Uh, and so those two purposes, I think you have to navigate those to get rid of them. I think the clear, whether or not you get rid of the tax or not, it's clear that the benchmarks that they used, the triggers or the metrics in 2010 are uh, inappropriate at this time. If you're going to keep the Cadillac tax, you have to raise those levels because of the, uh, the health care cost inflation. Uh, relative to other inflation. I, I don't think those lev uh, the levels that were set in the original Cadillac tax make sense anymore. Yeah. Um, that would be my response to that. $10,500 in 2000. Some, somewhat diplomatic. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well done, well done. Uh, Peter, $10,500 in 2010 seemed like a ridiculous amount of money to be spent on premiums. Now, uh, to Brian's point, a few years away, it doesn't seem that ridiculous. Uh, if I put it as an economist might, to say that stakeholders are making a clear choice. They think that the pain of having conversations with themselves about keeping costs low is more painful than the pain of trying to influence the political system to just simply remove this. Uh, does that say something about, do you, what do you think of that frame? First of all, maybe you don't buy the premise, uh, but does that say something about our ability or inability uh, our inability to fix things on the healthcare side, maybe our ability to game the system on the political side? Um, so I'd say a couple of things. I would agree with Brian in the sense that if you think about the dual aims are controlling costs and funding the Affordable Care Act, right? So those are things that need to happen, right? The Affordable Care Act needs resources to actually pay for the subsidies and pay for all the other products. Um, I think that's an artificial frame, and I think one of the things we've gotten ourselves locked into is the frame of it's a narrow point solution. I mean, one of the things in our population health, totally different topic, but um, we've tried point linear solutions again and again and again in the healthcare system that are somehow there's a legislative magic bullet that fixes it. Um, it doesn't change the underlying tension. It doesn't change the underlying thing. So I, I wouldn't characterize it as a lack of will, and it just isn't that people haven't had the hard conversations with one another. I mean, I, what, what our suggestion is you need a, it's a complex system with lots of unintended consequences. And so the more we tend to think about linear magic bullet solutions that solve this one piece of the equation, and if we just put pressure, we, I mean, economists would say you squeeze the balloon, it you know, expands in other places. So to me, the, the thinking about solutions is, is not framing them as much as we just need this solution. And if we write a new reg or we not write a new law, then we've kind of, that solves the underlying issue with healthcare. I mean, I think what you heard today, that I would say most of the conversation, even the policy conversation was nuanced. What are the actual getting at the root causes of these issues? Why don't we actually you know, address things through prevention and other strategies? So it just seems like there's a big contrast on the conversation the folks here are having, which is trying to address the key issues and underlying issues versus it's a single policy or it's a single, you know, kind of single magic bullet to fix things. Yeah. So Melissa, I, I, I think when I'm in DC, I, I hear uh, a lot of talk about legacy, not just in, at HHS or CMS, but throughout the administration. And we're getting nigh on that time of uh, administration where people will start to leave and things will not be able to get accomplished because there won't be people to answer the phone. Uh, I'm gonna answer my phone. <laughs> <laughs> what do you, what are you hearing about that, that, that sort of change as people are transitioning out and the, the, the rush to try to get some things done before we are in a full lame duck period? Um, observations there? Yeah, I think a couple of things. I mean, I think one thing that you're certainly uh, seeing and will continue to see uh, from the administration is a real effort to do everything that we can to make the implementation of the Affordable Care Act uh, part of the fabric of uh, our country, both from a regulatory framework perspective, from a how we do business perspective, to uh, the work that we're doing, a lot of the work we're doing on outreach and enrollment, since it's open enrollment now, working on getting people covered. It's not just about thinking as a, a set of add-on activities that are sort of separate from everything else that we do, but how do we actually embed that work into the everyday work, not just of government, but of our many partners in the community. And so I think a big part of the focus really is this um, making the work of the Affordable Care Act part of the regular work of our country, of communities, of individuals and families, where every year something we just do is sign up for coverage. That yeah. it's not um, the way it initially was, which is something um, 
extraordinary and outside the normal realm of what we do. And so I think you see that throughout the work of HHS, as I say, in all of our different roles, in our partnerships, and our regulatory framework. And I think you will continue to see that kind of embedding, making part of the fabric. I think another um, important set of issues from a, from a legacy perspective, and it actually relates to the prior conversation because um, an important converse, conversation around cost and affordability, the Cadillac tax is one piece of that, but obviously that is a much broader conversation. And I think for HHS, a big part of that conversation is continuing to advance our work on delivery system reform and payment reform. Um, and obviously we're very uh, focused and continue to work and think we've made some good progress on making health coverage more affordable, particularly for folks in the marketplace. Um, but the other part of affordability, of course, is getting to those underlying costs that drive health insurance coverage are the cost of health care, of providing that care. And thinking in a broader sense, the sort of what is happening in terms of prevention and overall community health and health status and how that ultimately folds into um, the cost of care. And so I think you will continue to see us press forward with our work on delivery system reform and payment reform, really thinking about um, doing that in a way that improves quality of care is very much focused on value, as was discussed, I think, mm -hmm. in the earlier uh, panel that was up here, really thinking about the value of healthcare um, and the way we spend our federal dollars, making sure that those are spent uh, wisely and, and focused on value, not volume, and keeping our eye on that prize, as I mentioned earlier, in terms of health. I guess the other um, sort of legacy issue, I would say, is that coming together of those pieces of healthcare delivery, health coverage, and that focus on health. So from the administration's perspective, uh, you know, the work that the Surgeon General is doing right now on walking and walkability is directly related to the legacy and the work of um, improving access to care, improving health, and making people's healthcare coverage meaningful. All mm -hmm. of those pieces coming together and really knitting that fabric. So Gary, we had, uh, uh, someone, we had the president of SEIU 2015 up on stage at lunch, and, and I asked a question that included calling on uh, her experience in labor politics. And uh, so I, I have a question sort of calling on your experience of, in, in business association politics, of which I'm sure there are some. And the LA Chamber was one of the very few and maybe the only major community uh, chamber to support the ACA actively at, at the local level. Uh, there were a lot of large corporations that organized and, and and a lot of big business got behind the ACA, and that was really a difference maker in the view of many pundits, that uh, having business be supportive of the ACA was, was what kind of what put it over the edge. But the US Chamber has not always been um, friendly with the Obama administration. Um, what are your, have there been repercussions to the LA Chamber? Uh, are there, uh, does that sort of framework put you in great position? Does it, because I assume that the Obama administration has uh, welcomed the engagement. Um, can you give us a window in how that has played out within association politics? Well, because all chambers have their own board of directors, we all make our own decisions. And just because the U.S. chamber takes a position doesn't mean that the rest of us do, because the state chamber takes a position, has no impact on local, local politics. Mm -hmm. We were the first business organization in the state of California to support health care reform when Governor Schwarzenegger proposed it. And we did so because our members were tired of 10% annual increases in their health care costs. And we were convinced by the governor and his team that if in fact we could engage more people in the system that in the end it would be good for employers they're already paying those costs anyway anyway because people don't have insurance get health care and it adds to the premiums that businesses pay for their employees but it was because we thought there was a chance of reducing the annual increases in cost that we became engaged. Mm -hmm. And so, if, but I understand how challenging it is to take cost out of the system and at the same time to make a major push on improving access. I mean, it's, this is tough 
to do, and we probably were a little naive in thinking that it was easier than it was. So when you hear complaints or concerns from other business organizations, it is simply because their members are saying it has cost us more money. We were told that we could keep our existing coverage, and now we really can't. Mm -hmm. And if enough people voice that concern, then in fact you have momentum to repeal or change or do something with the system. We want the Affordable Care Act to work. So far, I believe it has worked for a large number of individuals, but I'm not sure it has worked for business. What do you make of that, Peter? You know, looking over the last five years as a system thinker and an observer of the system, both nationally, but particularly here in, in California, how would you grade the ACA in general? So I think we're A plus on coverage expansion. We've cut the number of uninsured. Yes. Um, there was a statistic from Kaiser Family Foundation that we're at half of our historic rates, the lowest, I think, since we recorded in the 70s. Um, so I think that's a major success. I think a lot of it's through the Medi-Cal uh, expansion, but also Covered California is a success. Um, the question will be Act 2. I mean, so Act 1, we've created the drama, we've created all the characters are, are on the stage. Act 2, will it reduce costs? And the cost really will be for business, for payers, for families, and for society. Um, and I'd grade that as we're in the middle of Act 2 or at the beginning of Act 2 right now, so an incomplete yeah. in a sense. But I, I actually think we've been overwhelmingly successful in California in terms of the first phase yeah. of we, we've met our mark on expansion. We set up an exchange which we now know is much more challenging than anyone thought in terms of setting up either a state or a federal exchange. Mm -hmm. I mean, in California, it was relatively flawless. Um, and so I think, as I said, the access piece, which is the bulk, and then you see there are hundreds of experiments, CMMI, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, there are hundreds of experiments in California happening, and the question will be, A, are they producing cost savings at a local level, and then B, can we scale those? Mm -hmm. So I'd say we are in a cliffhanger, and we're at the dramatic moment of, you know, kind of act two, and we need to see how this play is going to end. You know, it's, it's interesting, you mentioned, uh Covered California being a success, I think by any measure, comparatively certainly, it's a success, yet it still struggles to, to earn financial sustainability. Uh, and I think, I, just, I think of that as a, just part of the challenge of doing all of this. And Sandra Hernandez's perspective earlier I thought was really important, which was uh, we just expanded access and coverage, or rather maybe not access, but expanded coverage and we have near universal uh, access to coverage, um, even if we have a significant number of Californians who are not opting in. Um, TJ, can I add a point on the, the cost piece? Sure. I think I'm trying to think what the right uh, point would be in terms of Peter's play analogy. Maybe it's other characters or sort of small scenes within the, the play within the play. But I do think we see some signs on the cost side that are worth noting. Because I, I completely agree. I mean, we've got 17.6 million people in this country who did not have coverage before the Affordable Care Act. Mm -hmm. And we still have more work to do there. We still have a number of people who are eligible for coverage, particularly for the exchanges who we haven't reached yet, who aren't aware of the financial help that's available to them. So we got more work to do. But on the cost side, I do think we see some signs of things going in the right direction, although I want to be very clear that HHS is keeping its sleeves rolled up and we have got more work to do on that front. But we did see in 2013 that in terms of uh, total health care spending, the cost growth was around 3.6 percent, which mm -hmm. was dramatically lower than uh, previous years. And obviously a part of that was related to the recession. We think a piece of that was probably related to the Affordable Care Act. The most recent projections for 2014 to 2024, 20, the next 10 years, put that average yearly growth rate around 5.8%. So higher, but still less than the double digit increases we were seeing prior to the ACA. And to Covered California's credit, I think their average plan rate increase was about 4.1%. I mean, I may have the decimal off, but in that range, that is way less than the double digit increases we were seeing in the private marketplace in California prior to the ACA. So do we have more work to do on affordability and cost growth? You know, do we need to keep doing the work of CMMI? We've seen some areas, some of the ACOs have actually seen 
um, some really promising results in terms of either cost growth flattening or actually reduction, reducing while seeing quality stay the same or get higher. So we've got some models that are showing we can increase value and address this issue of cost. So I think there are some characters in the play or some little side scenes happening that do tell us that we are um, on the path in this direction while we do still have more work to do. So but Brian, that sort of reminds me of the old healthcare analogy that uh, the patient is getting better, but it is still not well. Mm -hmm. You know, 5.8% is still very high, particularly compounded over 10 years. But I'm not aware of too many hospitals, and you work with a lot of hospitals, I'm not aware of too many particularly large hospital systems that shoot for 5.8%. Many of them, privately, will shoot for significantly more than that for earnings, uh, at least before interest, taxes, depreciation, et cetera. Um, how are you seeing a cultural shift within hospitals um, to grapple with this cost issue? Because if we have 55% of our spend or thereabouts of the total hospital system occurring in the inpatient setting, it's awfully hard to get cost under control if you can't figure out how to do it in the inpatient setting. What are you seeing culturally amongst the people you work with that might be addressing that? Yeah, I think uh, you know the, the uh, finding efficiency, reducing cost, uh, is the most significant challenge that uh, our hospital systems and really all healthcare providers you know, across the spectrum face uh, today. I, I, you know, I challenge you on, on the 5.8%. You, you look at most hospital systems, we'll, we'll, we'll pull out the uh, SEC registrant, the, the public registrant hospitals, uh, the systems out of it. it. The operating margin, median operating margin is somewhere between zero and three or four percent for you know, very highly rated health systems. You have you know, a lot of health systems that do very well, but it's generally speaking a low margin business. Uh, and so any gains that you can have on the efficiency side make a big difference for the sustainability of those hospital systems. And they're all focused on that. One of, one of the things that we're seeing uh, more often these days is uh, a move to you see lots of hospital systems going to a lean manufacturing process to try and streamline their operations. You'll have you have systems, particularly on the West Coast, that go to Japan every year to go through the Toyota uh, manufacturing process. So they send their whole management team over there. Uh, efficiencies within. Uh, clinical and operating uh, components of the systems is huge and it's a giant cultural shift that you've seen in the last decade because they're really realizing that the financing structure that they existed on in the past where you could just raise rates and those got passed through uh, no longer exists. It's a massive cultural shift and uh, that's going to be the case I think uh, certainly over the next five to ten years. Last chance for questions before I we have a hand up over there. Oh, it's yes. It's hard to see with the light. It is, yeah. Why don't you just boom, bellow, let us let us hear you. Yeah, hi. I'm uh, interested in the sort of workforce and economic development side of this question about the healthcare uh, industry sector. And during the recession, um, uh, they said the healthcare sector was one of the places where there was still some growth that there were jobs, that this was still kind of driving our economy. And I wonder, you know, today I've heard, you know, our shift to primary care, consolid consolidation on a lot of levels. Um, and I remember reading a few years ago in the LA Times that there were gonna be 40 hospital closures in the state, about 30 in LA County, you know, sort of standalone hospitals. And sort of this thought that we're sort of going to become leaders and leaders and all of the news that, that healthcare reform would drive this change in the sector. And so I'm just wondering, you know, with the success in enrollment, the demand for services, the whole question of cost control, do you still see the healthcare sector as a, as a driver? Before I, Gary, you, you seem like you're <clears throat> absolutely. It, it was healthcare was the only sector that did not lose jobs during the Great Recession, and you just need to 
look around and see all the people my age and all the folks that are living longer to know that there is going to be a demand for health care services for a long, long time. In fact, today there were the federal jobs report had 275,000 jobs created uh, in the last uh, month here in the United States, and 45,000 of those were in the healthcare sector. So 23-ish percent, certainly more than the 17, 18 percent that, that industry makes up as a whole in the U.S. economy. Peter, you know, does it become a concern when healthcare is so large structurally that it makes it awfully difficult to be economically efficient if at the same time healthcare is growing so fast. Uh, I mean, if you just look in pure economics terms, or economic terms, uh, most of our healthcare spend goes towards things that don't have multiplier effects, that, don't, that are not dollars passed on throughout the system uh, for additional growth in the same way that education does or that infrastructure like a, a bridge does. And so as we spend more and more to hire more and more people in an industry that does not have a multiplier effect, it can have self-limiting uh, uh, implications. Does it become a concern that healthcare is becoming such a large job provider in the system or uh, any observations there? Uh, sure, I have two observations. And one's interesting as a funder that we spend two thirds of our resources on healthcare and a th one third on any domestic violence. Um, and you notice the disparity, healthcare is over-resourced in a sense, and so here we are working with safety net providers on the healthcare side um, and putting resources, I think rightfully so, and working with safety net community health centers and public facilities. And then you work, then you move to your domestic violence, an equally complex issue which actually probably has huge positive effects if we were to end domestic violence in society or even reduce it. You have all sorts of kind of synergistic effects, probably in the healthcare system, but certainly in public safety, uh, foster care, child protective services, and yet that's a dramatically under-resourced field. And we, it, it's a field that is, you know, with marginally or incremental increases in investment, we probably could make, you know, huge increases on societal well-being. Mm -hmm. And so it's interesting, in our own work, we see the disparity or the, um, the what happens when you're super resourced in healthcare and under resourced in another social service. Mm -hmm. I mean, the one thing I would say though on the healthcare, I've been doing this now for 25 years, studying, working in healthcare, and you know, if I had a dollar for every time someone said, are we spending too much on healthcare, it's gotta end, well, I'd be wealthy, right? Because it's never right. ended and we, we are insatiable and we continue to do it. So we keep talking about an upper limit of whether we can spend more on healthcare, and yet we continue to spend more on healthcare. Yeah. Um, and so, I don't have an answer to it, just empirically though, I've heard that literally since 1990, before, I'm sure it's even before that, we've talked about, you know, was 12% too much, was 14% too much, was 18% too much, and yet people have spoken in some sense around putting more resources toward healthcare. Yeah. And so, I, you know, it's just, I don't have an answer for it, but it just, I, you know, we've been talking about this at least for the 25 years I've been watching. Yeah. Did his mic cut out? Can you still hear him okay? It's a little scratchy. We're getting, getting, uh, Low on time, I want to give everyone sort of a, oh, is there a question in the back there? Yeah, great. Yeah, I've been causing trouble all day, so there's no need to stop now. Good. Um, this is, I promise this is not a trick question. I'm going to say it as sincerely and respectfully as I can without having a shot of Jack or tequila. Um, can we truly talk healthcare reform without admitting that we have to take or move the needle out of healthcare be, be, being a policy and political issue and turn it into a more of a moral issue. Or if we are gonna make it a political issue, let's make it a real one. I mean, Department of Defense, they get a bunch of generals around the table and they say, we wanna build an aircraft carrier. No one questions them about building an aircraft carrier. They may question them about the cost, but they never question about whether we need one or not. And they find a way to get it done. If we're gonna treat healthcare like a political policy issue, then why can't we treat it like we do the Department of Defense? I mean, Lockheed, we have, we have government contractors fighting for those government contracts. In healthcare, we have government contractors, our providers, running away from government payments. There's something diametrically wrong with how we're doing this in this country. I'm not a socialist. I don't have the answers. 
but I think that in order to have real reform, we have to move the needle in healthcare away from politics and into something else. Brian, I'll let you solve that, that problem. <laughs> thank you, thank you, DJ. Thanks for not asking me. <laughs> I'll remember that. Uh, you know, I think it's a great question. It, I think you speak to the, the classic, is healthcare a, uh, a privilege or a right? kind of discussion which is underpins all of the policy discussions that you get into uh, but I think you can I think you can have a legitimate health care discussion uh, without necessarily going there I think we've seen that a lot with the reform that we've seen over the last five years in that the the, the increase in access uh, I, sh I really should say the increase in coverage that we've seen uh, from the Affordable Care Act I think started out as a privilege uh, versus a right discussion, and you get down to it, and I think a lot of uh, members throughout all constituencies would agree that, hey, providing this coverage has been a benefit uh, to all areas uh, of our economy, our community, uh, et cetera, and there's a real business reason uh, behind that, and so I think there's a there's an economic discussion and all, uh, another kind of discussion to be held without having to deal with that. Is it a p privilege or a right? Uh, for us, I think the biggest challenge now is converting that coverage to access. I mean, that's one of the most critical challenges that you have out there. Is we have, uh, you know, I think most necessarily 17 million people that gain coverage primarily through the you know, Medicaid expansion was the biggest piece of that. And they don't have the access that's appropriate to lead to the wellness that's going to reduce costs uh, in the system. And we need to have that access, uh, bring that out of the emergent care services and into a managed care, a preventative care, wellness care uh, environment. But I think to get really in a roundabout way, way outside of where the question was, uh, you know, I think you can have you don't necessarily have to deal with that fundamental issue in order to have real solutions and real discussions about health care policy in the United States and make some improvements. So Brian, I'll give you the last word, but I'll go down, down the line here and start with you, Peter. Uh, the type of people who are in the room today, the, we had about 12 walk-ups, so we had about 325 or so folks here this afternoon. They're not all here now, but... Uh, <laughs> Know who left. The, you know, the, uh, that's a pretty good crowd of thoughtful folks engaged in these big questions. So like the question I asked the folks at the end of the lunch panel, what advice would you give the community that attended today, the community that's staying? What should they keep their eye on in terms of reform moving forward as they go back to their day jobs next week? Sure. It's easy. Thanks very much. And congratulations on 325 folks. That's a great uh, accomplishment. Um, two things to me. One is, what's the outcome? Um, is it financial security? Is it access to health care? Or is it health? Um, I would argue one of the reasons that health care is different than the Department of Defense is that's national security, which we all can say it's keeping our families and communities safe from external threats or internal threats. And so to me, the more we understand what the shared um, goal is, the we actually have a shared definition of success, and are we moving toward that? As, as Melissa said, health. Is it health at the individual level? Is it health as a community? Is it health as a nation? And, and how do we define that? And then the second, and we haven't talked much about that today, but is truly patient and community engagement. And not the classic healthcare patient engagement, which says, enough about me, what do you think about me? But actually asking people what their aspirations are for their own health and how they're going to move forward with their family. If we do those two things, I actually think we'll get to the answers. I mean, the rest, in some sense, are details of how do you move between them. But it's setting a, a shared vision and making sure that we are kind of authentically engaging patients and communities in, in what they want to achieve. Um, so that's where I would start. Great. Thank you. Gary, thoughts uh, that th these folks should take with them back to their day jobs next week as they try to reform health care? It's all about cost control it's, uh, and, and doing it in three ways in, in my mind. One is greater efficiencies in all the care that you provide. Two, a focus on wellness, so you don't have to provide as much care. And 
the courage to talk about how much money we spend in the last year of your life. Excellent. Melissa? Uh, for, thank you. I didn't say thank you at the beginning for actually having us on thank the panel you. and for the folks who are staying. I appreciate that. Um, I mean, I, I guess I think, uh, uh, I don't know that I would characterize it as advice, but I think the reality is that some incredible work has happened by all of the people in this room and many of the people who were here earlier today to uh, begin to make real the Affordable Care Act. I mean, we. You know, I'm fortunate enough in my position to meet a lot of people who have gained coverage and uh, at enrollment events, all kinds of places. And it's, um, you know, in the earlier question, my, the thought that came to me and, and I've experienced this many times is it's when it starts translating to the fact that it's just a human issue <laughs> that you get change. And people are having that experience. People who were very anti the ACA are finding there is something about it that has benefited them. Um, and so, you know, I think it's just a very human experience. And so I guess it's not so much advice, but I would say it is hard work. We know it's incredibly hard work implementing um, all of the changes that are happening in the healthcare system. And every meeting I go to, folks have things that they're, you know, happy and good to see, and they always have challenges to share because those challenges are really real no matter what chair you sit in and what perspective you come from. So I guess the, the thought I would offer rather than advice is to, um, sort of keep in front even when the challenges are really hard, that human perspective of the difference that it really is making in people's lives because it is. Yeah, good. Ryan, last word. Uh, well, thank you, DJ, again, for, for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. I'll just say, you know, I think from a, a micro perspective uh, or more of a micro perspective, I think uh, mental health is obviously a huge, huge and uh, under-resourced, under-discussed piece of healthcare and really has so many different areas of our community, our society. Uh, I think over the next five, as we look forward over the next five to 10 years, uh, that's gonna be a phase 2.0. That's gonna be something that we're really gonna need to attack uh, as a healthcare community. And I think from a macro perspective, uh, you know, kind of fits into that population health. Yeah. You know, the concept is population health, a buzzword, uh, or is population health something that we truly uh, come together as in a co opetition environment where everybody's working towards, um, you know, the wellness concept and making our communities more healthy? I think those are the two things that I'll be yeah. looking for in the next decade or so. Good. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you, Brian Connor from Moss Adams, Melissa Safford Jones from HHS, Gary Tobin from the LA Chamber, and and uh, Peter Long from the Blue Shield of California Foundation.